Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to everyone. I'm Paula Wyman, editor of Scoundrel Time. I'm here with Karen Bender, fiction editor, and Daisy Freed, poetry editor, and a wonderful, talented group of writers who have generously agreed to be here tonight. And um, I, I'll just say a few words and then we'll get started. Maybe, maybe more than a few words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this past year and a half has been unlike many, unlike anything many of us have seen before or lived through. And I've spent a lot of time this year thinking about the power of stories and how artists are once again called on to be the voices that challenge us, that connect us, that enlighten and engage, that get inside of our humanity and inhumanity and make us look. The writers with us here tonight to share their work have answered that call and more. And I thank every one of them for their outstanding work. A word about Scoundrel Time. We launched the journal in January, 2017, a week after the presidential inauguration of that year. We are now four and a half years old. I'm pleased to say that we, are still going strong. Scoundrel Time is powered by volunteers. All of us donate our time for this project. And again, I wanna thank Daisy and Karen, and I wanna thank contributing editors, Robert Anthony Siegel and Dave Singleton, our amazing staff of editorial associates, Heather Hughes, Ellie Paulini, Sarah Gray and Kaylin Lamb, and our magical web technician, Francesca Filippi. Everyone working on Scoundrel Time is doing a dozen other things and still they make time for this journal and I'm grateful for all your hard work and dedication and enthusiasm. And I'm lucky to work with Karen and Daisy, two such fabulously talented women with endless creative ideas and seemingly boundless energy. Um, and I wanna thank all of our visual artists and writers whose fine work we've had the pleasure to publish in the past four and a half years. We look forward to many more. What you'll hear today is a great example of the type of work we publish, which is to say, we look for talented artists with vital voices who are using literary forms to address what's happening in the world and the threats to people, cultures, and landscapes. Other than our very broadly interpreted theme, we have no set style or type of work that we look for. We try to stay nimble and open to respond and engage with what artists are thinking about and what our readers are trying to understand. If you're interested in submitting work to Scoundrel Time, we'll have more information about that at the end and we'll post a link to guidelines. Um, we're able to keep going because of the continued support of our readers. I thank all of you who read the work by these talented artists. And I thank those of you who support us with donations. We are a 501c3 nonprofit and your donations are tax deductible. Um, we're going, Karen Daisy and I are going to say a few words about our readers for tonight, to introduce them briefly. Their full bios are available uh, on the festival website, which, we, which will be linked later on. Uh, we'll also include a link later for the, from the festival site where you can find writers works on bookshop.org or Goodreads. Um, so we have three nonfiction readers tonight. Uh, Jesse Van Eerden's recent novel, Call It Horses, was the winner of the 2019 Sank Books Prize for Fiction. Thomas Rayfield's most recent novels are Genius, a novel, and In Pine Light. Ken Massey's essay, Behind the Red Railing, which was published in Scoundrel Time, is his first published work. Uh, Daisy and Karen will talk about our poetry and fiction readers. Hi everybody, um, working with uh, the Scoundrel Time, both the editors and the support staff uh, and the writers um, has been one of the joys of this last few years for me during very hard times. Um, this is a storytelling, uh, conference, a conference about storytelling, I believe. And I was thinking about the fact that poetry does sometimes tell overt stories, but often doesn't. Um, 
the story of our times is always there underneath what we write, however. It's there in the work of the Nigerian poet and environmentalist Hussein Ahmed, who creates something between prayer and incantation in Suppose It Rained in Harmattan. Hussein will correct me if I spelled that, if I said that wrong. And in Exodus, uh, about places lost, people in migration, land in transition. Ahmed is an MFA candidate in poetry at the University of Missouri, has been published in Kenyan Review, Poetry, Transition Magazine, and elsewhere. His chapbook, Harp in a Fireplace, is forthcoming from Newfound Press. Story is there behind Nicole Cooley's On the Mississippi Levee, Styrofoam Cup in My Hand, both elegy and warning as Cooley's speaker watches the spillways, drinks from a non-biodegradable cup and thinks of her mother. Cooley is the author of six books of poems, most recently of marriage and girl after girl after girl. She grew up in New Orleans and directs the MFA program in creative writing and literary transition at Queens College CUNY. Uh, a story or multiple stories of about pandemic sex and teaching underlie Timothy Liu's whip crack tip of the iceberg odes. That might be a mixed metaphor, whip crack and tip of the iceberg, but <laughs> I thought of both. Uh, they're short, sharp, erotic, funny, and desperate, and seem to me to come out of twin urges to connect and break connection. Liu is the author of at least 11 books of poetry, most recently, Let It Ride. And he's the editor of Word of Mouth, an anthology of gay American poetry. He teaches at William Patterson University. And Glorious Piner connects all kinds of story fragments having to do with human experience, which is to say human need. In the lush shimmer of her experimental prose poem sequence, a series of portraits of the most dominant possessions in rap music. Her work appears in Queer Book, Conduit, Florida Review, American Poetry Review, and elsewhere. She's a poetry podcaster and editor and uh, Gloria's is pursuing an MFA in poetry at the University of Maryland, where she also teaches. She also teaches at the University of the Arts in Philly. Um, so I'm, I'm welcoming and help me welcome our scoundrel time poets. Uh, I think they will delight you. Uh, and now I'm gonna introduce the fiction writers. And also just, um, I'm also, it's, this has been really such a helpful thing for me in these, really awful years and um you know to to see how art can you know create connection and speak back to the forces that are so terrible in our world um has been really it's it's not healing but it feels it's so important um I, I feel like in the last year this has been a very lonely year in a lot of ways and the stories that I picked have to do with distance physical distance, emotional distance, and trying to kind of push across that. Um, in, when I work on fiction, I always look for the honest and the strange. And these stories, um, two of which are first publications for the authors, which are really honored about, um, do that. Um, so uh, first, uh, so we have Unawara Abbas, an MFA student at SUNY Stony Brook, who's also studied Hunter College. Uh, this beautiful, wistful story of voyeurs. It's about boundaries between neighborhoods, about otherness in Brooklyn and ways um, young boys cross them and ways they can't. Um, Cindy Bosley's um, prose poem uh, story, Algorithms, uh, is just a wonderful, uh, poetic, com uh, compelling story about the challenges of um, dating, finding love in middle age, and during the pandemic. Um, uh, Cynthia's poems, since he's a poet and essayist, and uh, her most recent book is Quilt Life, and she also has a Siren Sonnets, um, and poems in many literary journals. Um, Faith O'Keefe is a student at Yale School of Medicine. This is also her first publication. Um, we love being able to publish um, the first works of, of students because we we know that that they're going to go on to great things. Um, this is a kind of surreal triptych of moments uh, in a black hair salon with a shattering sky and with the protest. And it's about um, you know kind of it's called strange times. And it's kind of dealing with strangeness of everything around and and trying to connect within that. Um, Cherise Dosti. Um, 
is Zooming from Islamabad. Um, and he is a scholar in Pakistan. Um, he has taught at the University of Colorado um, and, and other universities, is currently at the International Islamic uh, University in Islamabad, is co-editor of the journal of Contemporary Poetics, has published a novel, Sasa, and, um, and uh, several other translations. Um, his, uh, his short story, Kill the Bats, is an honest account of isolation in an apartment in Pakistan involving a mysterious neighbor and some very scary bats. Um, so, and uh, it's uh, just an honor to work with Paula and Daisy, and now let's hear all your work. So uh, we will start with Munawar Abbas, uh, reading from Boyers. Thanks, Karen. Boyers. In Brooklyn, the sky is too small to fly kites, so we flew paper planes instead, hoping our futures went as far as they did before they fell. We'd watch, we'd watch the wind catch and carry them, but we'd look away before they fell, turning our head from someone who may have chance to see us unguarded for that brief moment. When we got to high school, we crossed the boundary no one had told us about, from 20th to 18th Ave, from Mapleton to Borough Park, from the Cantonese bakeries to the kosher meat markets, and from the public schools whose halls we decorated to the yeshivas whose Hebrew covered facades we could never decipher. Baruch was the first of us to cross over. He came to us on a Friday evening with a crisp $10 bill in hand, telling us only that we had to see it for ourselves. So we saw it for ourselves. On the Sabbath, we saw Orthodox men waiting for us outside as the sun set, offering money our parents couldn't spare, just so we'd go with their homes and light their rooms. We'd glimpse their girls, the ones our age. We saw their faces, surprised when the lights came on, pink heat on pale cheeks, the shame of being seen by someone not their own. They never moved, but turned their eyes away instead, turning us away from the part of them that lived there. We'd wait after school on Fridays in Grayson Park, passing time on the rusted bleachers while Orthodox mothers pushed their children in swings plus five. We'd mark time by the growing orange sun as it amplified the rust we rubbed our hands along. We'd pass time by dragging small branches in the soil beneath us, drawing outlines of ourselves that dissolved in growing shadows. We thought of those girls after we left their homes. On nights when the mood hid behind tall buildings across from our windows, we tried to imagine the ways our lives would cross theirs. Alone, I remember the girls I'd seen in full, whose faces that I saw for more than a few moments. I remember the girls whose faces I saw only in a flash in the first bloom of light before their doors shut. But I remembered mostly the girls who were receded, who I never saw, who I could only hear behind closed doors. My sleepless mind imagined the lives that lived in there. Those weren't the only times we were voyeurs. We were voyeurs in our homes when we watched our mothers cook and clean, when we saw them stand under trees, eyes closed, Bees and branches turning the sun to geometry across their faces. We were voyeurs when our mothers would leave us with others our age, and we'd wander away to corners to be alone so we could watch the others. We were voyeurs when we watched our mothers' tears as they saw the new world through small windows and small rooms. We were voyeurs later when we sprung from monkey bars and fell below, hiding from the sun in the shadows the bars made. We were voyeurs later still when we held hands with girls and couldn't look them in the eye find ourselves through jagged green soaked puddles and sidewalks. Then those girls would leave us, telling us there wasn't much to a person who only ever lived within themselves. They would tell us we were nothing more than the faces we had and the words we never said. They told us more, but we'd stop listening, watching other boys hold hands with other girls, later the same girls whose hands we had held. Years have passed and I've known more people since then. I've seen more people, been seen by less the accumulation less to effort than just the momentum of time. Some time ago, alone again, I went back to 18, hoping maybe to find one of the girls I've seen long ago. I only wanted a moment of recognition, nothing more. I found no one I could remember, though imagined some of them to be the same. I pictured them younger, their eyes closed and cheeks flushing. Later, I stood in Grayson Park and found a place where we'd wait for the end of Fridays. I watched the still rusted bleachers darkening in twilight, and it felt familiar but farther away too, just out of reach, a feeling I'd felt before. It was the same feeling I had when, from across the street, I saw a girl I once loved. Now a woman, she held hands with a man whose face was out of focus, which meant I could imagine he was a version of me, someone almost like me, but not quite. 
Okay. Thank you, Munawar. Before we go on, I just ask everyone who is not, when you're not currently reading to please mute yourself. Okay. Thank you, Munawar. Yeah, that was great. Um, next, we have uh, Hussein Ahmed. Thank you. Suppose it rained in Hamatan. Suppose everything beneath the sky wasn't dying of loneliness or hunger. Suppose we sought a new God that cannot stand the sight of blood. Suppose there's a new God in town. And nothing edible goes on extinction. Suppose we don't have to sing so high for our prayers to be heard above machine noises. Suppose we are no refugees in the land that holds our umbilical. Maybe mama's hair would grow into a green field and each one would flicker like a wet nocturnal beetle as we gather to pray for rain in Hamilton. Exodus. Once I looked forward to the time when I will join the queue outside a boot, coins in hand, waiting for my time to talk to someone on the phone. The war came and we talked our coins away. The telephone poles resisted the ebb, but they became sanctuary for pigeons with nowhere else to go. Mama told me all birds came from the desert, or they are the ghost of pilgrims that did not make it home from Hajj. The desert is the fastest route to the survival and has enough space to bury the amulets that slow us down. She asked that we decide if we want to return with our thirst or be baptized in the salt pool. She stepped on a nail the day she was to leave. It was supposed to be an omen, but she's excited. She was packed to meet with God on an arid land. A wanderer left home with a bag packed with pepper and antibiotics and a tongue that can only pray in Yoruba. Those are the two poems that are published in Scholar Times. Then I, because I still have time, I'll just read one more. It's called Curfew. Curfew. The war began on a school day. I saw men walked around with faces eclipsed in rage and grief. The moon was fatigued by its dwarf around earth. I was born with hair on my shoulder. Mama said I was Kinyu in my previous life. The scar on this forehead is a sign of reincarnation. She told stories to distract us from the dying voices. My mama's eye was a theater for men that praised the rusty edge of a blade as they would engage their lips to a garden of proteas. Wrinkles sprouted from the sides of her eyes after the new millennium. After the new millennium, boys my age died in sleep. On the sky that day were the stripes of all 99 shades of red. We walked streets during the curfew in search of florets. And for the first time in weeks, I said a song in praise of my lunchbox. We have all lost something. And in their memories, we held congregation in Kakuri Market. For once in our history that may go undocumented, our scars flickered as if caressed by the yellow hands of a sleeping God. Thank you. Thank you, Hussein. That was, that was amazing. Um, next, we have Ken Massey. Slipped up on me. Uh, behind the red railing, my childhood isolation. My first experience of isolation and social distancing occurred when I was four years old. My recollection of the episode is utterly clear. I often pictured in my mind as a time before color was invented, with the exception of the deep red of, of a handrail on the terrace outside my hospital room. It was the summer of 1957. It seemed that my babysitter had tested positive for tuberculosis. In June, I was scooped up and taken away by the health department. I felt fine. Nevertheless, I was whisked off to the county sanitarium, which would be my home for the next nine months. In my memory, the suddenness of my removal and isolation from my family was even more startling than the COVID outbreak we're experiencing today. None of my three siblings were taken away. It was just me. 
The sanitarium was subway tiles, asphalt floors, porcelain, and stainless steel. The place lacked carpeting, pictures, friendly colors, and televisions, except in the day room. My room mirrored the institutional starkness of the rest of the facility, save for the bright sunlight from the tall and wide south-facing windows. There was a narrow balcony with deep red steel railings that overlooked what seemed part of a golf course or maybe a soccer field. The glass door leading out to that balcony was always locked. I had my own bedroom, a child-sized round table and chair, and what I remember most, a wood frame upholstered chair. I had no radio and I couldn't read. Only in hindsight do I realize how truly isolated I was. Worse, I could receive no visitors. None of my siblings were allowed to see me and my parents were only allowed to visit twice a week. There were no other children there at the time, at least not in my ward. Aside from the janitor and one short-term patient, I was the only black person in the hospital. Despite the kindness of the doctors and most nurses there, I am certain that during my time there, I had my first encounter with racism. Nurse Flood, I remember her as tall, dark haired and pretty, taller than the other nurses who sometimes came to take blood or bring medicine. I'll never forget the crispness of her white uniform and the hat she and the other nurses wore and too, the coldness of her hands and fingers, which she used to dig into me whenever the opportunity presented itself. She did this most frequently during the first week of my stay when I couldn't stop wetting the bed. She'd make me stand naked and ashamed in the cold room while the bedding was being changed. It was only after weeks of this that I began to wonder if it was because I was brown. Fortunately, she was transferred or chose to work in another wing, but there were other fears, monsters in the room and under the bed, lurking behind the slightly open bathroom door and even among my toys. For a time, there was the fear of death, whatever that was. I'd seen people die on our TV at home, but those people always came back on another show. And then there were the nuns with their crosses, black hoods and habits, which I'd never seen before. Whenever I saw them coming, I would hide under the, under the bed and hope they wouldn't find me. Gradually, I began to feel death couldn't be so bad, not because I was so miserable, but because its inevitability seemed better than uncertainty. I stopped quaking whenever a nurse entered the room. I understood that one nurse with a tray or a wheelchair was better than one with a cart or two with a gurney. The adults in the day room never let me watch cartoons or Zorro. It was always sports or the news. One day when they were all watching the news, no one said a word about the images of black people being jeered as they walked with their books into a building that reminded me of the hospital I was in. Later, I heard the nurses indistinct chatter about Eisenhower and he was sending troops someplace. Are they coming here? I asked. No, baby, a nurse replied. That's in Little Rock, a long way from here. It has nothing to do with us. As time passed, my fear was gradually replaced, replaced with curiosity. What did the nurses do behind that desk a few yards from my room? What happened when I pressed the red button on the wall next to my bed? Were there other children? When toys no longer amused me, I plotted my escape. Of course, in my mind, it wasn't plotting, but I thought about it while I watched the changing of the shift nurses. I wondered how the elevator worked and who was in the hallway and when? How far down it was from the second floor? Could I survive that leap? One night, one winter night, just after Christmas and near the end of my stay, I attempted to make a run for it. There were blizzard conditions outside. Dressed in my new bathrobe, a gift from the hospital, and clutching my Zorro action figure, I made it as far as the front glass door in the lobby before realizing I didn't know where I was and I had nowhere to go. The few snow-covered snow cars parked outside appeared to be monsters with frozen teeth where their grill should be. And they were waiting for me. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Kenneth. That was incredible. Um, uh, next we have uh, Cindy Bosley.
This is from Algorithms. One, it's becoming clear. Too many platonic male friends from online dating got my inbox like tasteful hummels from the internet, believing that their own spiritual thinking is both wise and novel, as if no one but they have read Thich Nhat Hanh and the Upanishads. Man friend N and I talk on the phone sometimes. This day, while I listen to his investment in being a vessel for my hope for enlightenment, I'm counting the grooves the cat has made in the lower doorframe. It's legitimate meditation, so I let him continue. My other friend, W, is vague about his 12-step interests, and so I don't know if he's a legit alcoholic, a wizened and grimacing heroin addict, a meth chemist, or a guy whose only lover has been Pornhub for the last two decades. Could be a combo. My other new friend, W, pardon me, number two. I've been dating online for seven years, give or take two engagements. Seven years, it means I don't waste any time with the riffraff, am a little bit bitter, and have buried myself in my own shortcuts, rules, and codes about who is right and who is way, way wrong. The easy ones, straight please, and non-smokers only, and local within a 45 minute driving radius, parking spot to parking spot, I figure I want to be able to kiss after work. When I tell a man, no, thank you, the only gracious response is, okay, thanks, and be safe, or some version of that, but most of the time they try to talk me out of it. They try to explain how Detroit to Toledo is only a 35-minute drive when any testosterone-balanced person knows that I-75 is frankly hellish every day and in all seasons, and I live south of Toledo, and he no doubt lives north and west of Detroit. It's an hour, and that's a generous Google Maps estimate. The other suitable mate criteria are sneaker, sneakier to tease out. Pretty much any man who won't claim his own politics is a no. And lately, guys who won't say whether they are vaxxed or anti-vax, and the mask in the time of pandemic dating is a full-on matter of consent. Are you breathing with other people? Three, one man confessed to attending an in-person church. Plus, he was the drummer, so I figured he had to. Surely he was masked up. Plus he worked in shipping, so I figured like a fool that he was masked there too. Then he sent me pictures of him and the guys on break, arms around each other, all faces naked. I felt like I'd been mooned. Four, starting any chat with what's your daily life like tells me whether he works third shift or lives with his mom. I've got a full-time day job, a high schooler, my own aging mother down the road, and I don't have time for commuting dates or sneaking in through the garage door after the 11 o'clock news, trying not to bounce the headboard too loudly against the wall of his mother's sleeping room. I want a man who doesn't get his favorite green beans and special gravy every night. Five, when I ask which current events are most personal to you, if he says the Amazon union fight or those kids still in cages at the border, I know we have some promise. But if the general essence is keeping the libs from taking my guns, or I stand, or anything about the economy, or they got to stop killing those unborn babies, and freaking snowflakes and their shelter-in-place bullshit means we do not occupy the same round earth. Responses that include those damn looters and Blue Lives Matter and flipping Antifa or the dreaded voter fraud each tell me he doesn't mind his own racism, among other things. Also, if he uses endearments or text type before even asking my name, he's gone. How you doing, beautiful? Those lips, I want to get to know you, gone. Six, I just bought a Subaru, the car for lesbians, my daughter tells me after the fact. I look it up, get deep into Reddit posts and niche blogs and articles on car advertisements of the 90s coinciding with Ellen coming out and the boon that now comes from marketing to woman loving woman demographics. I don't have a carabiner clip on my belt loop and my middle and youngest daughters have absconded with my favorite and only two flannel shirts. And my eldest just now told me that eyebrow slits are a signal coding lesbian teasing me that I could rock that look, mom, and I'm suddenly getting a whole new tide of Facebook ads, Pinterest pics, and TikTok feed, and I don't even TikTok. This is only funny because their dad is gay and married 
and everybody pretty much wonders who I will find and when. This is a certain kind of life. It's quiet with poems, long baths, coffee, deep sleep, cats, butter. I love so much about living alone. Like the meme about the longed for beloved says, your presence will need to feel better than my solitude. Thank you, Cynthia, that was awesome. Um, next we have Nicole Cooley. Hey everyone, it's so nice to be here. And I just want to thank uh, Karen and Paula and Daisy and all my fellow readers. Um, I'm gonna read uh, two short poems, one that was in Scoundrel Time recently and one that kind of spins off the Scoundrel Time poem. And um, the first poem is called On the Mississippi River Levee Styrofoam Cup in My Hand. On the Mississippi River Levee Styrofoam Cup in My Hand, that will disintegrate in 1,000 years. I drink my coffee, stand in gravel in my church skirt, black velvet I wore to my mother's funeral 11 days ago. Take a photo of my own shadow on the railroad tracks to Snapchat to my daughters, while this river outside my parents' house is risen higher than in years. Spillways opened, live oaks sunk in mud, grass littered with plastic bags and beer cans. Levy trash, a photo essay, my former self might think. That self so well versed in irony, that careful daughter who would take notes on weeds and garbage and shut her notebook. Now on the levee, a white truck speeds by too fast. Maybe a man who picks up shifts on rigs for extra money. And in a former life, I'd write a poem about how that man might be dangerous to my daughters. Now I write nothing. I'm here to walk off my restless sadness, to walk off my mother's voice years after the storm when the city flooded, telling me she will never leave New Orleans, no matter how high the water rises or how many times levees breach, telling me she will die in her house. No evacuations, no hospitals. Now I know grief has its own typography. Mine is this city and this coast. So that was my Scoundrel Time poem, and it was the poem that sparked a project I'm working on now, which is about garbage. I'm writing a book of poems about trash, and I've done I've been done a deep dive into the research on, on garbage. It's super fascinating, um, incredible, actually, and um, and it's been really interesting. And I won't talk all about trash for an hour, but I could. I'm just going to read my poem. But um, one thing I started doing during the the last 16 months of the pandemic is taking these long walks um, where I live outside of New York and New Jersey and taking notes on what I found on the sidewalk. Instead of looking up at gardens and the sky, I would take notes on trash on my the notes app on my phone. And so this next poem is about that. And it's also about the experience of being a parent um, during these last 16 months too. So I'll end with this poem. It's called Trash. Pink rubber pacifier in the dirt under a tree. Tall boy can. A Pikachu costume we think must be left over from Halloween. Forever 21 bag that once held a dress. I tell my daughter, it's the small things that will save us. Together on the broken wooden railroad tracks by our house, we take pictures on our phones. When my daughter says the world is ending, I try to offer comfort by telling her how she was a baby during 9-11 and how she remembers nothing of the ash smell burning that leaked into our apartment as we sealed the windows with her cloth diapers. I describe Hurricane Katrina, how I couldn't leave her and her sister to go down to New Orleans to save my parents, yet they survived. We walk further in silence, and I'm grateful not to be reading the news. Grateful for time with my daughter, home from a college she may not return to. The train tracks are a trench, a long grave tumbled with bodies, and we could follow these tracks, tunnel under the Hudson River. After our walk, I read a gratitude list in an old notebook. Blue hyacinth stuck in the dirt, broken glass prisming light. This does not comfort. After our walk, my daughter's tears leak into me when she cries in my arms, too old for it. Thank you. Oh, wonderful, Nicole. 
Thank you. Um, next, we have Thomas Raphael. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this little essay is about a used bookstore in Red Hook, Brooklyn called uh, Free Bird Books. It's based loosely on this bookstore. Peter runs a used bookstore. Runs is the wrong word. It's an act of charity. Peter has a real job, but when the store's previous owner gave up, he bought the stock, took over the lease, and kept it open Thursday and Friday nights, as well as weekends. It is on an inaccessible stretch of waterfront, one of those isolated slivers sheared off by Robert Moses's Brooklyn Queens Expressway and left to die. There is no nearby train. To get there involves walking above several lanes of severely incised highway. For a while, Peter made a go of it. He organized events, a post-apocalyptic reading group, movies projected on the back wall of the adjacent building, book-themed barbecues. Briefly, a trendy Thai restaurant opened down the street. It had lines out the door. People waiting wandered into the store. Some of them recognized Peter from his other life. What are you doing here, they asked. What is he doing here? Maintaining a tradition whose economic model is long defunct. Peter doesn't pay for used books. They are donated or he finds them left on the street. What little money he makes does not begin to meet the rental utilities. A used bookstore is like one of those freakish pools that form in the middle of a stream. The current rushes by on either side, but here is cessation and a corresponding rise of something else. Whatever is tamped down or drowned out by the time and money driven rhythm of our daily lives. It is useless, valueless, and precisely because of that necessary and restorative. But you can't justify its existence by any of the standards currently held dear. It's wasted space, a dropped stitch in the fabric of things. I haunt these places, chase them down as they disappear, walking further and further out to where housing is decrepit but affordable, the locals still scruffy and some of them word obsessed. Recently, Peter got married. Now the store's hours are down to weekend afternoons and evenings. He has led a group, Books Through Bars, take over the basement. They send pr books to prisoners. The inmates are asked what they would like. It's an interesting mix, how to draw in simple steps, Howard Zinn's alternative American history, a workbook for aspiring entrepreneurs. One January night, wind was howling through the arms of the few remaining container cranes that dot this section of the harbor. A huge alp of salt stockpiled by the city for imminent snowfall loomed opposite. Inside was only one customer, Augie, an elderly man killing time before returning to a home he described in such vague terms we were not sure it existed. He was a former longshoreman, he claimed, who used to work around here. Toothless, he sat by the space heater Peter keeps up front, munching on some unidentifiable roll or sandwich, much of which escaped his mouth and scattered over the floor. I feel terrible about this, Peter whispered, but I think I'm gonna close early. I don't want him to feel kicked out, but no one else except you has been in for hours. Before leaving, I did what every author does, even if he tells you otherwise. I checked the shelves for titles of mine, for any proof of my existence. As usual, in my alphabetical niche was nothing, just an imagined emptiness between Ayn Rand and James Redfield's The Celestine Prophecy. I left, walked a few blocks and looked back. Augie must have headed in the other direction. I didn't see him. The light in the window was still on. Then it went off. Freezing, I turned to negotiate the walk uphill, back to civilization. Thank you so much. Mm, great, thank you so much, Tom. Um, next, we have Shiraz Dosti. Thank you, thank you, Karen. Um, so this is called Kill All the Bats. 15th day under lockdown, 22nd in self-isolation, and I had already lost most of my muscles. Not that I was a wrestler before that not even a fan of that violent sport. Sports like wrestling are based on fake hatred and fake are real. Hatred is like a virus. Once you get it, you become its carrier for life. 
or you do then is spread it around. But total inactivity makes its own claims to our bodies. It unleashes a violence of its own kind, slow, quiet, invisible, destructive. And as of today, I was losing my mind too. Shouted a sentence or half of one at my saintly brother every time I passed by his room on my way to the bathroom. Why are you still in bed? I said. This bed has handcuffed you. What are you up to sitting over there? What makes you stand against that window? Throw that phone away. Why don't you kill that fly? I know you stay up the whole night. Too much caffeine is gonna damage your muscles. It was almost evening and I was feeling my flabby triceps sitting on this toilet called the Indian Sea. Must on them with workout. Enough of watching bad horror movies. I washed my hands for 20 suggested seconds and went straight to the third room in the house that had a treadmill, two dumbbells, a yoga mat, and a wall mirror in it. While on the treadmill, you have to look towards your right if you want to check on your triceps or hips in the mirror. The first thing I saw was my face. A thick, black, blotchy beard and an upturned mustache. The rest of my face was pale as poison. Fresh air, I needed fresh air. I went out of the room, across the corridor, and unplugged the fridge cable that was hanging on the way to the stairs, threw it onto the dusty railing, climbed two steps at a time, and arrived on the roof of my house. It had been four years since I last came here. My Pakistani American friend, Ali, had wanted to see the Twin Cities before boarding his NYC flight in three hours. Given the time constraint, there was no question we could go to the Margalla Hills. This second floor rooftop was the only viewpoint readily accessible. And it showed him almost half of Islamabad and a little less than half of Rabalpindi. And from the hug he, he had given me in front of the international departure gate, I could tell he was happy with the roof. With humans and automobiles indoors for, last, for the last two weeks, the air was fresh. I felt the color of youth returning to my cheeks. On the rooftop of a big house across the road, some children were shouting their high-pitched and meaningless words at the blue sky. On the roof behind mine was a pale, fatigued skull wearing a pair of skin-tight blue jeans and a red t-shirt and a green surgical mask. A glance at her was no less refreshing than the oxygen I had come looking for. I sensed some sort of, some sort of intimacy, agreeability. After all, we shared a longing for fresh air and for the color to return to our faces, mine mustached has masked. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shiraz. It's wonderful. Um, next, we have Timothy Liu. Hello, hello. Thank you, Daisy Freed, uh, for writing these four poems in the pandemic. Flaccid COVID Ode. Through a book party, but no one came. <laughs> Flaccid COVID owed through a book party, but no one came. Make no mistake. You didn't wear a mask to the Hasid funeral during Mardi Gras. You didn't plan ahead and bring enough PPE to the BBQ in the Lone Star State, where abortions are no longer available except through drive-through or curbside pickup. Ode to distance 
learning. Where else can I watch porn and grade student papers in my zippered mask? Ode to distance learning. Where else can I watch porn and grade student papers in my zippered mask? Ode to sexual distancing. I like your sleep mask better when you pull it down to gag your mouth. Ode to sexual distancing. I like it. I like your sleep mask better when you pull it down. Pull it down, baby, to gag your mouth. And I'll end with a new poem uh, that I wrote just before coming on today. This is called No Brainer. All Americans now dying of COVID remain unvaxxed. Think about it. No brainer. All Americans now dying of COVID remain unvaxxed. Think about it. Thank you. That was great, Timothy. Thank you for sharing those. Um, next, we have Faith Okipo. Everything changes, and so do we. The salon had changed with the times. Its once bright constitution manifested in the rising voices of its patrons and in the flurry of their carefree movements. Free to gather in embraces and to touch the shiny curls and coils in admiration was now more uncertain. The door was closed and locked, unlike the days when it was held open by a silk green scarf. The pale gray of the waiting area walls lacked the warmth of brown bodies, yet the occasional figure passing by, captured in a now dreary frame of the window, indicated that the salon was not exactly closed. Perhaps it was intentional, this selective invitation. Maybe the Black Lives Matter protester with the braids unraveling from tearing at them in frustration would know to enter. Once inside, she'd find cool milk for her peppery eyes and hands that could plate those strands into more resistant shields. They'd suit the hand that held the sign that read, and will it ever end with cooling Vaseline? We needed something from each other. The customer sitting in a now partitioned hair station and the stylist silently smoothing her hair. We needed to express something in the way the stylist's familiar hands knew to gently detangle an afro from the ends, prying the hook-like strands of parts. And when the stylist asked, have you been deep conditioning lately? We knew she was speaking to some more fundamental nourishment, to the way we applied creams to our brown skin at night and stared deeply into dark cavernous eyes wistfully. In our collective maintenance of the Afro, which rose upward as if seeking grace, we spoke words that could not flow freely from behind our masks. The stylist could close the distance between us with a comb pressed to the scalp as the dry heat stretched the strands at the roots. When she divided the hair into even rows, like the rows of bodies crying out for justice in the streets or the bodies that had fallen like cleared woods to an unyielding ax. She brought us closer than the face shields with their concealing fog permitted. When she was done, we both marveled at her creation, the large hair that floated at either side of my small brown face in the mirror. Was that sadness in her eyes or knowing? 
Did we have the same vision of my dark reflection as something distinct from the world, like a flower in a field of grass, destined to be plucked in derision or from curiosity, to brown, to wither? I seemed like black art, something to be hung in worldly halls and discussed with wine, the center of a riveting anecdote about African wilderness. Fit for a protest, she said, with a smile. In that smile, I saw a glimmer of sunlight. There was a shadow of laughter fanning at the corner of her eyes. I thanked her. As I left, she shut the door behind me and I could see her spraying down the seats where I had sat. I turned, heading downtown towards the shouting voices. I could hear the music, a medley of R&B, rap, and something rhythmic from a block away. I walked until I was surrounded by people. Our bodies gathered like a rising mountain, our lofty hair dividing the sky like clouds lifting us to the heavens where we could seize the sun by its day's rays and mark ourselves with its brilliant glory. It seemed that way until you squinted through the glare of the face shield and saw each person standing apart and yet together with longing. Thank you. Mm. Wonderful. Oh, thank you for it. It's so great to hear that out loud, Faith. Thank you. Um, next, we have Gloria Spiner. Hi, everybody. I'm very grateful uh, to be with everyone tonight and to be in this like virtual Zoom chamber of, of uh, full of echoes of poetry. Uh, on that note, uh, I like to start every reading uh, with someone else's poem. I like to use my readings as an opportunity to not just share my own poems. Uh, but to celebrate, to celebrate poetry in general. Um, so I'll be reading uh, Two Trains by Tony Hoagland. Then there was that song called Two Trains Running, Mississippi blues they play on late night radio, that program after midnight called FM in the AM. Well, I always thought it was about trains. Then somebody told me it was about what a man and woman do under the covers of their bed, moving back and forth like slow pistons in the shiny black locomotive. The rods involves trying to stay coordinated long enough that they will get to the station at the same time. And one of the trains goes out of sight into the mountain tunnel, but when they break back into the light, the other train has somehow pulled ahead, the two trains running like that side by side, first one and then the other, but the fierce wit bursts of smoke puffing from their stacks into a sky so sharp and blue you wanna die. So then for a long time, I thought the song was about sex. But then Mac told me that all train songs are really about Jesus, about how the second train is shadowing the first. So he walks in your footsteps and he watches you from behind. He is running with you. He is your brake man and your engineer, your coolant and your coal. And he will catch you when you fall. And when you stall, he will push you through the darkest mountain valley up the steepest hill and the rough chuff chuff of his fingers on the washboard and the harmonica woo woo and the long soul cry by which he pulls you through the bloody tunnel of the world. So then I thought the two train song was a gospel song. Then I quit my job in Santa Fe and Sharon drove her spike heel through my heart and I got 12 years older and Dean moved away. And now I think the song might be about goodbyes because we are not even in the same time zone or moving at the same speed or perhaps even headed toward the same destination. For God's sakes, we are not even trains. What grief it is to love some people like your own blood and then to see them simply disappear, to feel time bearing us away one box cart at a time. And sometimes sitting in my chair, I can feel the absence stretching out in all directions like the deaf defoliated silence 
just after a train has thundered past the platform, just before the mindless birds begin to chirp again, and the wildflowers that grow beside the tracks wobble wildly on their little stems, then gradually grow still and stand motherless and vertical in the middle of everything. All right, Tony Hoagland's Two Trains. All right, so the next poem I'll read uh, is one of the portraits, the word portraits that I have published in um, The Scoundrel Time, which is a poem that is in many ways uh, about song. It's about hip hop, um, but it's, a, it's about song, uh, which is more or less about harmony and more or less about chaos, which I, which I really do think is, is the stuff of this moment, um, finding harmony and chaos. So um, this is portrait number three, a portrait of the gutter. A portion of the trauma is in the bowels. Take the only, take of only the stool and tug. A poor gutting is off at the rugged fault of the utter. You top rate, low rung motherfucker, you pit thug, you gutter snipe, you hard R and rope, truck, rut, you run down and trot off, motherfucker, you pretty ain't no glitz if. Ain't no grit, mother, you grimy, you no talking about the fire only churns the coal. You know the noise of chains sweeter than whatever the dead man know. You know the code we live by and that every man has a price when them decrepit bricks don't sell or to this you might say is at the other end of fault. At the foggy impenetrable liquid running deep, deep hardening thing. And that's usually right before they note the doctors hovering over the cold resection table, the blood flooding in the peritoneum. But somehow this time they'd forgotten to unhinge the tube streaming embalming fluid and got instead of a lifelike corpse, what we call art or human artifact. Thank you. Mm, that was fantastic. Thank you, Glorious. Um, and then we'll end with Jessica Van Eerden. Thank you, Karen and um, Paula and Daisy for inviting me. And um, I'm really honored to read with everybody tonight. Um, I'm reading the essay that was uh, published in Scoundrel Time called Blessing for the Lice Check. Miss Rozier, who was childless, had us bow our heads to our fifth grade desks on the appointed day, as though for prayer. She slowly ran the side of a pencil from the nape of each neck to the top of each head. We tried not to shiver as the pencil slipped slowly up our skulls. And if later a name was called over the intercom, we knew they had it. They'd be shaved bald, they'd sit alone, smelling of lime and chemical, on the school bus that cut through our small mountain town to deliver us home. Once a girl was called and she quietly left the classroom with her jacket tied around her waist, her fate sealed. But I found out later she didn't have lice. She only needed a maxi pad from the school nurse because she'd gotten her first period. And I didn't see why she had to be called over the intercom as though it were a cause for alarm. I didn't see why there couldn't be a cute closet for Kotex in each classroom, amply supplied for shame-free access. I didn't see why when my friend told me years later it was unlawful to buy tampons with food stamps, though she said a woman named Lena who owned a corner store by the tracks had let her do so. My friend and I, perhaps because of these specific memories, always get on board for the tampon drive at the parish house. The boy at the Walmart register must think I'm hemorrhaging as he scans my packages of always and Tampax. Look at this blue and pink arsenal, I want to say to him. Think of the semiotics of feminine hygiene products, their shifting meanings. A tampon can signify relief after that one unprotected night and later grief, the child you wanted once again not materializing your childlessness takes your breath in the middle of the night as you overspill your pad and bleed onto the sheets and learn a new shame and hold up your useless hands like iridescent frog hands 
outspread in the dark, thinking, for whom will these hands, like my mother's hands, disappear into the bread bowl and reappear, kneading the punch down dough, knuckles flaked in flour, even though wiped on the tea towel before it covers the bowl of rising dough? For whom will these hands, like my mother's, fold pepperoni into pinched off segments of store-bought dough and brush the hot hair away from the face to reveal out there the river, the bend, the mist filtering off it, the cobble bar and the stones to be held in little hands, and this, the tail feather of a heron. Whose small body will I bathe as my mother bathed mine and filled the Pizza Hut cup to spill over my sudsy hair? But the body, the hands, they all shift in meaning too. Since today, my mother, in the absence of children, bathes her mother with hospice hands in an atmosphere of multiplied life, years hanging spectral and wavery scenes. Though we don't discuss it, I suppose soon my mother will not have a mother, but is that fully true? Will she be motherless in the same way I am childless, the absence born of loss, no different from that born of unrealized life? Are these even the right questions since my mother's hands will only and always find another to touch and bathe and wipe the hot hair from so the remarkable river mist smoking off the box elders is in full view of the blinking eyes. We cannot be less than we are, less a mother, less a child, but maybe we can be more than we are named. And if our hands reach to touch and do touch so gently another it's as if a new meaning congeals with each moment of contact, a new nameless form of relation fused between two that were once strangers, even as my mother and I once were at the very start. In this, I begin to see a way opening before us. Come to think of it, how could I have said my fifth grade teacher, Miss Rozier, was childless when during the mandatory lice check I felt her pre present hand at my neck, parting my long hair as though parting fine feathers, sifting through the strands with the dull pencil lead for any sign of tiny white parasite, each soft stroke of the pencil like a blessing whispered over me, me, her child, knowing her mercies. Thank you. so wonderful, Jesse. Um, thank you. Uh, Paula, did we want to have a little discussion? That, that was just so great. That was terrific. I, I just, I, um, I think it's, it's clear, first of all, how much talent there is uh, on this screen right now in this room, and so much variation and um, just so many different styles and thoughts and ways of looking at the world. And um, I wanna thank you all, uh, but don't go yet because I did. I, I think we did have a couple of questions for you. I, it, unfortunately, it seems like we can't take audience questions, but Karen, you had, you had a question. Um, I, oh. yeah, I mean, I, if there's a better question, we could. <laughs> I, I, I had one that was just like, "What did you learn about writing during the last year with the pandemic, with the with the um, election, with the protests? Is there anything you learned about writing in that time?" Or feel free to jump in. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll jump in on this one. Um, yeah, like I think during during you know I'm also a. a teacher, I teach at CUNY, and it is, it's very easy during this time, starting with the election of Trump, for language to feel incredibly meaningless and what we do, especially writing a poem to feel utterly useless. But was, as I would tell my students, like, this is the greatest time in my I've ever seen in American poetry in my lifetime. It's an incredible, inclusive, diverse, democratic. It's wonderful. And language matters more than ever, is what I just told my students in this time of alternative facts and lies and Twitter and all of the other stuff that and that's like loud voices screaming at us, what could matter more than the language of art and the language of poetry? So I actually found 
myself thinking a lot more about what, what kind of work language can do in the world and what the purpose of poetry is and teaching about that and thinking it through with my students and thinking of that wonderful Lucille Clifton quote, which I'm going to bungle, which is, I wanna write poetry that comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. Um, and it just felt like this was such a moment to think about that quote. So, um, so I did a lot of kind of thinking about poetry and what language can do and a lot of teaching about it. And um, I think it did inform my writing practice as well. But I found that like, for example, like when, when the news would be terrible, when the Trump news would be terrible, I would go on YouTube and I would like type in Natalie Diaz video and just like watch <laughs> Natalie Diaz. She, she was always great when the news was bad. Natalie Diaz video or any poet that I loved, I would just type in their name and go watch them read for 10 minutes. And it was like a balm. It really was to just feel that language mattered and meant something and could do something to shape the world. Could I, could I jump in too? Please. I felt that language mattered almost immediately when I saw, I think it was Cory Booker on Twitter, try to like, like forge a kind of Twitter poem to like make some kind of structure or sense out of this moment. Like, I think it was like last year, as soon as we hit shut down for the pandemic, it was Cory Booker tweeting out poems. And I was like, but poetry does matter in this moment. It really, or poetry matters period. But I think this moment really surfaced the necessity of it. something. I think for me, uh, I hadn't written in a long time uh, for a variety of reasons. When Can you come closer to your microphone, Ken? I better? Yes. Hey. Yeah, I think for me, uh, I hadn't written in a long time. And for me, uh, during this year, I think I uh, rediscovered my sense of where stories are. You know, it's just like all of these things have been laying flat for so long. And then there was this dust storm or whatever that stirred everything up, This uh, the storm that stirred everything up, brought it up into the air. And I was able to see stories in places that I had perhaps not looked before or I had just ignored. So I think that was probably uh, one of the biggest things I've gotten out of this period among many things, but that certainly is, has been big for me. We have um, several writers in the room who are not from America. Is, is the answer different for you? Obviously, sort of a dumb question, but. <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> um, for me, um, during the pandemic, I kind of imagined isolation as a form of um, religious practice or spiritual thing. Because where I come from in Nigeria, there is um, this religious practice we call khalwa, which is like a seclusion where you be alone and then meditate and pray. So during those times where I was in my, my room in Oxford, Mississippi, and there see you said I was um, I'm, I'm earning my MFA at the Missouri University. It's a uh, Ole Miss University of Mississippi. So um, when I was in my room, I just kind of just think about what is happening outside to be something beyond my own reach. And then I just imagine my own space, my room to be a space where I can just meditate and write. So I, well, the kind of writing I did all through that time were tied to Khalwa. So I have a song, I have, I have a poem called Khalwa with the song bed of Wasolu. So um, if I have a particular um, song that I'm listening to on a, on a particular day, I'll do, I'll then write a poem which would be in conversation, which that song I'm listening to, which is basically all what I did all through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, um, to answer the original question, I think what I learned from writing in the pandemic is how therapeutic writing is. So I wrote most of my story when we had a three month break from medical school. And I think writing is just like a powerful tool to grapple with complex emotions, especially during that time. You had the massive death toll of the COVID-19 pandemic, but then you also have the image of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement that was also occurring concurrently. So then you have like all these emotions and I found that writing was just a way to put it all together and make sense of it for me. 
Uh, can I say something? Please. Thank you. So uh, I think what, what I learned during this time was how to look around myself better, because as, as my world was, uh, was shrunk into you know, a small apartment room, um, I was able to look at and observe more keenly these minor, smaller, minute things. Um, because earlier, I, what, what I've been trying to do was like thinking about you know, transportation, intergalactic transportation and things like that. So, so my stories, they, they didn't work because most of them, they were not grounded. So when I got thrown mm -hmm. this you know, on the bats, because it was about myself and things around me, so it, it suddenly, you know, worked and when I then had care and so uh, time to you know, accept it for, uh, for a certain uh, time. So I think that this is this is what I learned better. And, and it was looking around myself and writing stories about about uh, about about uh, things around me. So that is probably the best gift that this uh, uh, bad time has brought. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I just know for myself, I felt, I just felt so battered by so much and just all the energy of having to push against all the lies, you know, from so many sources. Um, you know, the idea of expressing yourself just felt so, it did feel very healing. You know, you know that that there's so much energy spent in trying to push back a lot of terrible things. You know, just to write something and just write, you know, that feels honest and real. You know, even if it's fiction, you know, um, just was so healing. So just yeah, just physically, I would feel differently when I sat down and wrote. I think for myself. Um... At first, I would I would try to shut it all out in order to write because that's my normal way of writing is to isolate myself. <laughs> but when I was forced to be isolated, well, and not exactly isolated because my entire family was home, um, <laughs> so that there was there was the feeling this kind of need to want to shut out things in my immediate environment and also shut out all the noise what was going on outside, but. What I found was that it worked better when I didn't do any of that and instead tried to address uh, all of those things in my work. Uh, I made one more thing that occurred to me uh, while listening to the rest of you talk and maybe it's uh, <clears throat> reflected in the essay that I read from. Uh, what I hadn't expected was the familiarity of it all. Uh, the isolation, the uh, racial unrest, all of these things that happened uh, when I was younger and before. So there was a kind of familiarity uh, in this, which was it's kind of unexpected. I mean, not that I've ever uh, been in a pandemic, but uh, I was really surprised at the parallels and the similarity of it all. And that, uh, I guess, I don't know that it was a comfort, that it, but it was a, well, like anything familiar, your uh, your capacity to be shocked is probably diminished in some respect, and I mean that's not a good thing. But uh, <clears throat> so I guess I've begun to look for what's unique about it, you know, uh, and uh, I'm more keenly aware of what has changed from the standpoint of uh, writing about it. So there's this. To me, it was a, there was kind of a paradox, you know, for lack of a better word. <laughs> Thank you. I think the two pieces, one is that um, I've been working with a, the same writing group more or less weekly for like 25 years and our membership changes sometimes, but, but it's made me, um, and this is just fine with me, it's made me very deadline driven. <laughs> it's made me you know, conscious of when we're meeting and when I need to write something before that meeting. And uh, so I give thanks that I, I have been 
employed during the pandemic. And, and um, that's really uh, been incredibly uh, important, of course. But what it meant was that my workday ends and I have this much time before my workshop begins. <laughs> and so I found two things happened that I really wanted to write something before workshop and that that compressed time block that I had in my life that day, it, it meant that I abandoned all the rules about, you know, who am I as a writer? Am I a poet? Am I, do I write prose poems? Do I play with fiction? Is this auto fiction? Is it creative nonfiction? I just kind of threw all that out of my head, not purposefully, but that kind of freedom to just go with what, what image or what atmosphere is there to grab today. And I appreciate that about this very strange, very violent time. If, uh, if there are, it, does anyone else have a comment? Um, if, if, there, if there are no other comments, I think maybe I'll just ask Karen and Daisy to say a word about um, submissions for the journal. Um, we haven't specifically talked about that, but, um, but first I wanna thank all of you because this has been an amazing event and you're all terrific readers and the work is, like I said, just it just blows me away how uh, unique and individual um, everyone's work is. And uh, I'm, so, I'm so glad that we could have you here tonight and so glad to have your work in the journal. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you, Paul, so much for putting <laughs> this all together. Yeah. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure. Yeah, I also want to thank you all. I feel so honored you're all sharing your work with us and feel so nourished by it. And, you know, we really, we really appreciate it. Um, and so in terms of submissions, I guess, what, uh, we're ongoing. <laughs> we're always accepting work. Please uh, spread the word to anyone you know that might have worked that might be, you know, relevant. Um, and yeah, we're posting all the time and, and looking for things that are engaging with what's going on around us. Yeah, um, I'll just say also really thank you from the bottom of my heart. It was just a great reading, various and delightful and fascinating. And uh, I'm, I, you know, as the, I'm the poetry editor and I, you know, I, I'm gonna say something vague too. But I'm going to say that I'm looking for work that uh, in where the public, the political, and the present moment is weather to personal experience and vice versa. So I, th I think people, I hope that people could hear how different uh, everything was. There is no scoundrel time type of work per se. Um, and in nonfiction, well, I'll say this, in fiction and poetry, we take uh, submissions via submittable. There is no fee ever. Um, and for nonfiction and visual art, we also publish visual art. Um, please send uh, a query or a pitch to uh, our general mailbox, which is general at scoundrel time. Dot com. This is also in our guidelines, which the link is going to go up shortly. Uh, there'll be a number of links posted shortly um, to some of our readers' work and to the whole list of bios for everybody and um, link to Scoundrel Time and so on. Thank you. <laughs> thank you thank you hi again everyone this is uh karen your host from 1455 um my co-host ellie is going to put up that uh, uh title side real quick and um that has all the links just want to let everybody know that's watching um because the session is is being recorded um, and it will be available in just a matter of a couple of hours on the attendee hub. 
Um, if you don't have a chance to furiously write down these links um, during uh, right after this session, you can go to that pre recorded session go through to the end and you can see those links again. So you'll have an opportunity, plenty of opportunities to, 